everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Griss and I'm the gallery curator at the Coonahan Gallery in Brunswick. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our first ever virtual floor talk and a virtual gallery tour. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Woiwurrung people, uh, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge them also as traditional custodians of the waterways in the area, uh, now known as Moreland. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging uh, and to any First Nations people who are joining us here today. Um, we are very lucky to have uh, uh, four special guests with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Um, uh, before we uh, introduce them, I'd like to introduce our, one of our two Auslan interpreters, Sarah, um, who you will see on screen at present and um, every 15 minutes or so, Sarah will be changing over with Kiki. And we're also joined by Jason today, who will be captioning this event. But it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce um, the three artists of the Confluence exhibition, Claire Bridge, uh, Jeremy Blinko, and Emmy Mavridis. And we've got a very special guest with us today also, uh, who will be responding to the virtual floor talk, Deborah Hart from Climart. So she will be joining back with us later and I'll be introducing all of our guests in more detail as we progress. Uh, the format for today, we will be uh, talking with one artist at a time um, and then Deborah will be responding and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So um, when we uh, when we come to the Q&A, you'll be able to um, send us um, your questions in the chat section. Also in the chat section, I'd just like to draw your attention to links to the virtual gallery tour, which has just been posted up today on, on the web. You can access this link also through our Facebook page or our Instagram page. And, um, there's also a link to the Confluence catalogue, a wonderful catalogue which has a contribution from Ashley Crawford. Uh, so you will be able to access those links also through the social media uh, sites I've just mentioned. So um, I would like to introduce our first uh, guest today, um, which is Claire Bridge. And, um, Claire uh, is uh, not only, um, Claire is, is the coordinator, I guess, of this exhibition, as well as a contributing artist. Uh, Claire is a queer feminist interdisciplinary artist of Anglo-Indian and culturally deaf Australian heritage. And her interests lay in the intersections between art, neuroscience, somatic experience, queer ecologies and feminism and her work responds to issues of ancestral transmissions, gendered violence, internet, intergenerational trauma, and the confluence of these concerns with the environment and queer ecologies. Claire is also interested in the possibilities for empathy, repair, and care in a practice which involves video and sound works, installation, sculptural ceramics, uh, painting, and textiles. So, I hope uh, you. I hope you will make you feel welcome in the way that you can. Uh, please welcome Claire Bridge. Thank you so much, Victor. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially with such a great group of artists and yourself and Deborah here today. Thank you, Claire. So, Claire, um, I, I I have uh, questions about. I'll leave the questions about the origin of the exhibition perhaps till later on when I can uh, talk to all of the artists. But I, I wanted to start with um, one of the, the pervasive kind of colours in this exhibition, which is um, indigo. And uh, it's a new medium for you. So can you tell us a little bit about what um, natural indigo is and 
what drew you to Indigo and why you have chosen to work with it. Thank you. I might even uh, share my screen at, um, as we go so people can see some pictures. And uh, if anyone could just let me know that the interpreters are still visible for them uh, as we go, that would be really helpful. Just get that organized for you. So for um, this show and, and given the Given the context with coronavirus and the changes that um, artists are adapting to, and I really needed to work from home, um, obviously, with isolation. And one of the things that had been really interesting me for some time uh, in my work is really looking at you know, ancestral kind of cultural transmissions. And indigo is a material that has been, is an ancient dye, it's a natural dye. Um, there are many plants that you can get indigo from, but indigo ferra tinctoria is the one which um, is especially bountiful for producing indigo, and that is grown in India. So that's where my father is from, and I wanted to kind of come back to a material that would say something about um, my ancestral origins, but also a material that is sustainable. Um, and now is having revival because it's, it's really amazing in terms of sustainable farming. It regenerates land, you know, between crops. Um, so there's all these other things about indigo that I love, including, you know, medicinal, traditional medicinal herbal uses. Um, you know, indigo, for example, is great for the flu. Uh, these are the traditional uses. So in terms of using it at this time, it seemed kind of exciting in lots of ways. And it's beautiful, like the blues that it generates. Um, it's very mysterious. It, when you work with indigo, it's working with a living material in a living dye vat with organic material that's um, sensitive to temperature, to, to slight changes in acidity. So it's like um, a, a very magical material. You know, even when you dip the cloth in and you bring it out, it's yellow. So it takes time for that oxidization to happen and for the changes in color to appear. So there's all those sorts of things that interested me as well as changing how I work. So surrendering to materials. So when you dip the cloth in, it's not, you can't really see what's happening and you mm. pull it out and then you can see what the dye has, has done, which is a very different way of working. And I felt like that was something that, that even this time of isolation is kind of calling on, is a kind of surrender to, to the moment, to, to the time, a, a letting go. So uh, there was all those things that were playing into me wanting to work with this material. Fantastic. I, I, I've certainly reminded when I saw your work of um, uh, that, that use of that use of indigo was the um, cover of the uh, Rebecca uh, Solnit um, uh, book. The um, uh, I had it on my screen before, but I've lost it because you're sharing your screen, uh, Claire. But I know Rebecca Song it was a, a, a played a, um, a, a sort of an influence in this uh, exhibition. Yeah, the, um, the there's a, a piece of writing um, which we've got in the catalogue there about the blue of distance, and that was also something that was really kind of important in the work was, you know, there's the distance of location, you know, the, the distance that we're separated from each other right now through, you know, social distancing and isolation, but also the distance of this continent, you know, halfway around the world, India and Australia being separated by vast oceans and the journey that, you know, my father made and, and his parents made from India to Australia, this, this separation of distance, but also the separation of, of time and traditions. Um, and yeah, the, the distance of, of these countries and, and culture and, and history. So there's, there's that, but also when you look into the distance, Rebecca um, Solnit talks about a yearning. And that was kind of the thing that the distance brings about um, when I think about it is, is like the yearning and longing for what is is beyond you, uh, which I think is something that artists 
always work with is something kind of just beyond the edges. They, they bring something out of maybe the void or the mystery and, and into reality, that yearning for that. Um, and the closeness and intimacy that that kind of evokes at the same time. So, you know, looking towards mountains is yearning for mountains, but also the sense of closeness and connection. Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, can you unpack for us a little bit um, when I was introducing you about the somatic experience? Can you unpack that for our, our audience a little bit and um, what your investigation into that has entailed? That's a really great question. And dying is such a somatic experience, isn't it? It's a body experience. You know, the hands go in, the indigo seeps through the pores, you know, there's, there's warmth and wetness and, you know, working with such large reams of silk, you know, 11 meter silk there, I had to wrap it around my body physically, um, as well as, you know, going from the vat to the rinsing trough to the, you know, hanging it out on the line outside. There's a whole lot of body involvement in that. So it becomes, um, it becomes that somatic thing becomes something which is, you know, in the present, a bodily movement, but also on that cellular level, the, what I wanted to connect with too was kind of like a sense of the DNA of the materials, but also the lands of my ancestors on that somatic level to feel that, you know, as the indigo seeped into my skin and even turned my hand blue, which is one of the images in the show, um, that there was this kind of, um, yeah, this immersion, a full bodily immersion, a full connection uh, with with that culture and history, ancestors, and this beautiful material, these beautiful plants um, with the earth itself. Yeah, um, the one of the, I was like, going to ask if you could share that image on your screen of the hand, the, the, the dyed hand. Um, uh, one of the other things I was curious about, um, uh, Claire, was whether you see your work as image or object uh, not in not in relation to that particular image but uh, particularly for the hanging works that's very interesting too I think there is both um, I I really see that these works are uh, more object in some ways there's a, there's a tactile and physical experience of moving around them in space um, as an image, you know, they, they can be on the screen, but they really don't translate very well, in, even in this digital space. Um, the luminosity of, of the silks and the glow and the shift of color, the way that, um, you know, as an object, even just the, the shifts of movement of air ripple the silk. So it, they are very kinetic kind of pieces as objects. Um, and they contain sort of images in them. I've just had a message here, um, Claire, just to uh, um, have Jason, our captioner, has, is trying to access the meeting there. Have you, can you see a request there from him? We've got the captioner. Yep, the captioners yep. are, okay. are working. Yep. It may, sorry, it may have been an old message. Sorry, <laughs> okay. I, everything's I'm on glad. silent here, so I don't interrupt anything, but hence the lag time. So, um, Claire, I might just ask if you can unshare your screen just for a, for a moment, what people so people can see you a little better and our, uh, also our Auslan interpreter a little better um, while I go to, uh, to my next question. So you talked about um, uh, ancestral transmissions. So, I mean, you've, you've touched a little bit on that. Um, how does it relate to the theme confluence? The confluence really um, is about, you know, many things flowing together and many things that influence and um, yeah, influence each other. So at the same time. So a confluence, like for example, um, you know, one of the interesting things about, I'll just switch over here uh, to the other interpreter for us. 
one of the interesting things about even the word confluence is that, you know, for example, where my father was born is the confluence of three rivers. So there's the Ganges, the Yamuna, and the Sarasvati rivers. So we've got three rivers kind of coming together in a place um, which, when he was there, was called Allahabad. And with this show, we've got three artists that are coming together. And each of us has different interests and different ways of working, but there are common themes, there's a, there's a flowing together. So in terms of um, ancestral transmissions, you know, I'm thinking about all of these things, you know, the British colonizers that came into Assam where my great grandmother was, um, the, the, the plantations, the indigo trade, all of those things have informed the work, but also, you know, I've benefited also from the privileges of of that British um, colonization. And also there's the Indian and Assamese influences um, that have, you know, have come through my ancestry as well. So those cultural transmissions, uh, both the light and the dark, some of it's, you know, great and some of it comes with a, a very fraught history and there's, you know, intergenerational traumas that come with that for, for many people that are, you know, in a situation where there's been colonized um, histories. So it's complex. And um, yeah, I wanted to bring some of that into, into the work in a way that could celebrate uh, some of the beauty of those traditions. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. I just wanted to uh, address a few things that are popping up in the chat um, with regard to the screen views. Um, so you might just need to check at home your gallery view. Um, we uh, at the moment, um, uh, we're, we're certainly able to see everybody here. Our interpreter at the moment is uh, on the larger part of the screen um, for our people who are hard of hearing. Um, we, um, this is, please bear with us and be patient. We are, this is the first time we have done this. So there may be a few little bumps along the way, um, but, uh, just check your gallery view, which is should be up in the right hand corner of your Zoom meeting box, and that may help. Um, yeah, we've got gallery view going, and I'm just making sure we can pin that uh, interpreter so she stays visible even when we talk. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Claire. My my next question was actually, and it it, it is a question that could equally be addressed to your your co artists as well, which is. Um, there's a, there is a sense of the of the body in this exhibition, even despite its absence in a way. Uh, a lot of the way, um, I think, or well, for me, I can say the way we read the work is actually with with our body. Uh, there is um, a much that there's some sort of sense of relationship to um, to the body. Um, as we engage with the work. Um, something that I know was something I was very conscious of, um, particularly in art, uh, art of the top end and Central Australia. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you see the relationship uh, of the body with either within your practice or to response of your work? Yeah, I think um, the body has been quite, um, a recurring theme in my work from even when I did quite a lot of figurative painting, um, you know, almost hyper-realist style through to the sculptural works that I've done more recently, a series called Bombshells, which really looked at, um, you know, perceptions of the female body, you know, distorted perceptions of sexuality, gendered violence, uh, but also in a humorous way, kind of playing on the idea of a bombshell and these bombshell shaped uh, objects. And in this show, the body appears, um, I think, subtly. So it's, it's in the ripples of the mountains, which, you know, at different angles can look like, you know, the forms of the body, you know, the roundness of bellies and hips. So it can, it, it, there is a relationship there in the imagery. Um, and I think what part of what I'm wanting to say in that is about that interconnectedness that there really isn't a separation. If I go to the park and stand under a tree, 
you know, I'm breathing out the trees, breathing in and, and converting that carbon dioxide and then, you know, restoring me with oxygen to breathe in. So that, that cycle of interconnection is, is immediate and part of everything. And that's part of, I guess, the message in the work is that the body and what we call nature is not anything outside of us. It's something that's a part of us and, and we are a part of. Uh, thank you for that, Claire. Um, I might ask you one more specific question about your own work, um, which is the, in many ways for me, it's kind of the centerpiece of the exhibition, which is the large hanging silk river, um, uh, titled That Which Remains After All Ceases to Exist, Shesha. Uh, and about snakes. Can you tell us about the work? Sure. Um, well, snakes is an interesting thing. And, you know, when you look at the work, some people immediately kind of get a sense that it's a river, but, you know, looking a little closer and if you can look from above as you walk past, you'll actually see the head of a snake um, or the tail of the snake in, in the lower part on the floor or looking up into it, it can kind of get a sense of, you know, the cobra hood um, as this, the cobra might be standing up there. Um, and Shesha refers to the naga or the, the snake formed being, um, you know, deity being, which is a representation of Vishnu, one of the, you know, the, the triune uh, gods in the Hindu tradition. So, the symbolism with snake across many traditions, whether that be the Hindu tradition, perhaps even in um, indigenous um, First Nations traditions here in Australia, or in, um, in across the world, the spiral form and the snake form has spoken to things about creation and destruction. And these, um, this form with the, the snake um, also represent also representing the river. Um, yeah, it's kind of telling both of those stories about the mythological and spiritual traditions, um, but also in the water form. And, you know, personally, um, I've had some interesting experiences with snakes. Uh, happened to, you know, a few years ago, just uh, when I was at Hadda Lakes, which is up in New South Wales area, was out there doing some, you know, on plein air drawing and taking some pictures and you know, just looking at the beautiful scenery with the, with the river red gums being um, saturated with the, the flooding water that comes through that area. And heard this sound behind me, which was kind of, you know, a heavy rustling sound. And I thought, oh, that sounds a bit heavier than a lizard. And just turned my body and saw this amazing sort of black headed brown snake all curled up and uncurling. And, you know, we're sort of eye contact and I was very still and watched it unfurl this beautiful six to eight foot long, happened to be a taipan, which is the deadliest known snake that we, we know of, um, cut about two feet away from me. So fortunately, I, I stayed still and was just kind of mesmerized. Um, so there are, I guess, my personal experiences of the snake and the awe of that symbolism. Um, any personal experiences with them, um, but with, yeah, with the traditions of, of um, water and, and myth as well. Um, I wanted to finish with, I, I suppose it's more of a, uh, of a, a general question, um, Claire, which was, and this is of specific interest because of course we will, um, later in the conversation, we'll invite Deborah Hart from Climart into this conversation, but I wanted to know, um, how the theme of uh, confluence relates to your concerns for the environment. Yes, so I think these times, um, especially with coronavirus as well, have magnified many aspects of our society, including um, the damaging impacts of, you know, human-induced climate change. So being able to talk about the confluences of all things, you know, whether it's economics, whether it's society, culture, belief systems, you know, how we live, eat, breathe, 
all of these things are interconnected and part of what I want to, I guess, bring through in the work is just an awareness of that or a sense of that so that, you know, we may emerge from these times with um, a greater respect for our environment and a, a more sustainable way of working with our environment. Um, yeah, so that, that's part of the confluence in, in terms of that. Um, it's, it's time to act or it's beyond time to act. And I really mm -hmm. hope that we can, we can find better ways of doing things. It's so great seeing that even in this time, you know, with less cars, less planes, less industry, you know, that some areas have been able to recover somewhat. There are cities that have seen clear skies that have, haven't for, you know, many, many years. Um, the Himalayas are visible. So there, there's a great sense of hope in the capacity of, of our earth to recover when we work with that. Oh, I think that's a really nice um, sort of juncture for to sort of um, uh, conclude this part of the talk on, Claire, because I think your show is, is one of the successes for me of your exhibition is that there is a, a, a great gravitas to the show. There is a great seriousness. Um, there's a warning in this exhibition, but there is a there is um, there is a light. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, um, and I think it, there that you haven't lost that element of hope in your exhibition. Uh, so it's a very delicate balance, and it's um, but I think you've uh, I think you've achieved that. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claire. So um, Claire is now going to actually Claire's. Uh, um, basically uh, has, is hosting this as well as um, as uh, being one of our special guests. So now I'm hoping that Claire, as host with Zoom, um, will be able to address you know, a few, few of the concerns that have been appearing in the chat. Um, but I would now like to invite uh, Jeremy Blinko uh, on, onto the screen. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is a photographic artist and a, and a visual storyteller. Uh, he's, he describes himself that his purpose is not to reflect the world that we see around us, but to explore an interior world, the mind, uh, the mind of the individual, but also the mind of the community, uh, the shared imagination of the group. Um, and like peeling layers of skin from an onion, it's a slow process of gradual steps as he digs deeper into these imaginative psychological spaces. And while his images often spring from the personal, they seek through the process of becoming artworks to be reformed in a mythic visual language that can be shared by others. So welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Jeremy, um, so you are, you're a photographer, um, but uh, I should mention that while in the exhibition, you are represented by several large photographs that you also uh, would have to call you uh, to some degree, a sculptor um, uh, or a uh, material-based artist with the um, amazing examples of, um, uh, for the want of a better word, wood carving, but I know that's doing them an injustice. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your photographic practice and also how it relates to the, the more three-dimensional work uh, and the materiality that, that seems so evident in, in, in both, both aspects of your practice? Mm -hmm. um, the I mean, the photographic series, it's, it's titled uh, Not Tree, Not Not Tree. Um, I began um, making this series in, um, at the start of, of lockdown. I think in some way it was a... We usually... Had... Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we just we just um, lost a little bit. It's the it's the joys of Zoom. Um, uh, <laughs> we just it was just a microsecond or two. Um, 
Yeah, so in, in response to um, the sort of travel restrictions, um, I was forced to, well, I wanted to seek sort of a sense of wonder and, and, and in touch with nature that closer to home. So I'm fortunate to live uh, about sort of five minutes from Carlton Gardens. Um, so I decided to, to photograph um, the same peppercorn tree sort of every morning between sort of 6.30 and 7. Um, trying to understand or, or, or get to know a, another being, um, which, which is perhaps never possible to, to fully know something, but it did throughout the sort of regular, through every day um, and intimacy um, and sort of sense of kinship. Um, and in terms of when, when I first began this sort of mode of encounter, I was, I used my camera in a way I was sort of drawing or, or, or a way of sort of cartography of, of mapping the, the tree in, in the territory. Um, then, then I could sort of move from there to a um, sort of a mimetic or sort of practice in which I would imitate through my bodily motions, say for example, the, the trembling of the leaves in, in the breeze. Um, yeah, so that's been, I mean, been a wonderful process um, of photographing and I'm, and I'm still sort of continuing to this day. I think I'll, I'll probably keep going until at least summer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, the, the photographic practice. And how about the, how about the works which um, are more sculptural, the, the circular works that, uh, for those who are I, at the moment sort of guiding themselves through the virtual tour, they'll see two circular works on the real wall. There's also um, a relief work on the right hand side of the gallery too, which is, um, these are kind of scorched timber works for, um, uh, for people wanting to know a little bit about what the material is. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so all the, all three works are um, scorched uh, Monterey Cyprus. Um, the the circular works. I mean, both. The, I mean, the sort of common theme between a lot of these works is um, there's an ocean surface, and in the circular work, there's a, a sort of a vortex or a whirlpool, and and the larger one is also an ocean surface. Um, I've always been. I guess drawn to of control and 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 a black ocean or an ocean surface as a sort of metaphor for the subconscious um, and the fact that we are not often sort of the authors of our own stories as much rather than one part that's perhaps at the mercy of the sea or winds or um, and that we are influenced by sort of a myriad of other forces. Mm. Um, and this work in, in, on the left is another something else that I think about, um, which perhaps may come through all my work is a sort of sense of fragility and that I'm often amazed that, that things don't dissolve into chaos more often and, and not perhaps always at, at the larger scale, but even the fact that that our lights work and the sewage goes and that these are these are immensely complex systems that that work seamlessly and let alone the fact then you get to the sort of ecological scale and that we've had a sem some semblance of balance for such a long time is sort of does does amaze me. Jeremy, can you tell us a little bit about the 
uh, how you how you source the materials. Um, I'm thinking in particular actually of the rectangular work um, of a similar nature, which maybe Claire can find for us uh, further down the page. Um, it seems, oh, sorry, there it is, that's the one. Um, it, it, it's, it's wonderful how it reads because it is a, it is a piece of scorched uh, timber, but it reads so much like a landscape um, from perhaps from a bird's eye view. Um, can you tell us how you, you sourced that material and how you worked it? Um, I guess for all, all three of these works, I've sort of I've, um, have a relationship in, with a, um, a sawmill in Fish Creek. Um, so I, I managed to, there was a fallen tree and he um, has sort of called me a few times and I've been, been able to get the, the slabs from there, which I sort of store away and dry um, and then turn them into these works. Um, this, this work is titled uh, 1993, which is actually the, which is the, the name of the, the algorithm. So it's, it's a, so, so Cinema 4D, a, a computer program has, has generated this ocean surface um, which is then um, CNC routed um, to, to create the form. Can you tell, for our, for our audience, can you tell them what a, a CNC router is? It's, I guess it's perhaps like, a, like it's a 3D printer, but with a, um, a, a router bit, which, is, which basically cuts timber. So it will, it will go through hundreds and hundreds of passes like layer by layer until it carves out the detail, if, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of scorching the surface, how, how do you go about that? Is it, do you use a, um, a torch or do you have it over a fire or how do you, how do, you do that? For, I, I have done both, but, but for these ones, I use a, um, yeah, just a, a blow torch and just, and slowly do it, and then sort of can emphasize certain parts as well that you want to burn more. Um, and I also sort of, I guess, I use a spray bottle as well. So I just I just do it gradually. Um, but I mean, that's it. I really thoroughly enjoy that part of the process in the scorching. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I've I've seen some of your earlier work, and the work in this exhibition seems to be what I would I would call um, more abstract um, at least at the very least it's certainly less figurative um, do you see are you conscious of that change in your work Jeremy is that something you're aiming to do or is it just happening organically I think I think it has happened organically probably through everything I've been reading and, and thinking about. And I mean, even, but even in my, my figurative works are always in within landscapes. So they're always a part of, they weren't, they weren't. And then, I mean, I've been thinking about ways to sort of like a decentering of the human figure and, and sort of, and that sort of collaboration with nature and becoming sort of, we lost you a little bit there, Jeremy. Uh, uh, there? Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. We we I think we may have lost we may have lost Jeremy. We'll see if we can get him to reconnect. I was just I had really one more question for Jeremy. Um uh, which was to, to continue on from his, uh, I think we have Jeremy back. I had. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I'm just making sure we yeah. have our interpreter back because I can see Sarah has frozen, but um, I will press on. Uh, so Jeremy, the, the question I had um, leading on from uh, that 
uh, that question about figuration and you talked that, about landscape but being really, I guess, um, maybe the protagonist in, uh, in that previous work. In this exhibition, there is one image which I find incredibly powerful, which is the um, large photograph in which in its very center, and you, you kind of do have to look a little bit closely, is to see that there is actually uh, a plane in, in its center flying through the air and what, look, what could be, I mean, it, it's probably just the light from the window, but it, it kind of looks like a spark or a, a flash of lightning near it. Um, can you tell us how you caught that image? Well, I, I guess because it, I mean, the skies have been very quiet for a long time. So it's when I, when I saw that plane, there's a, there was a sense of excitement, like to capture it that, I, that I've never felt before. I and mean, obviously we, we're living in the city, we're used to seeing planes over here all the time. Um, so I, I mean, it was, it's a, a long exposure. So it, I guess I, I track, track the plane um, into the, and then offsets going into the, the foliage of the, the peppercorn tree. But yeah, I was, I'm drawn to that image too, because it perhaps for me, it, it, it is a sense of the unknown where, where the plane's flying to and, and what the sort of future might entail. Well, that, that, that is. I, I think I, I know where you're heading with that while um, uh, at the moment you're just, you froze it a little bit there, Jeremy, but I, I'm going to take a leap of faith and um, one of the things I like about that image, it, it is that sense of a, 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 there's a journey um, inherent in, in, the, in, the, in the story of that image and the, the plane looks so fragile, uh, it looks so small, it's, it's, uh, there is a sense of awe, there is a sense of great kind of elemental magnitude around it and it, um, it, uh, I think it does very much speak uh, symbolically to where we are traveling at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's it. And then the illness is that we are one sort of more insignificant part of a, of a much greater whole. Um, yeah. Well, look, thank you, Jeremy. Um, we will leave your questions for there for now. Uh, please stay on board with us. Um, we might try and see if we can get a better connection with you for the group Q&A a little bit later, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'd like to now uh, invite our third speaker um, to the screen, uh, Emmy Mavridis. Um, Emmy is a, uh, a sculptor and um, I, well, actually she's much more than a sculptor too. She is a painter and she's a printmaker also, but at, the, at present her practice seems to revolve principally around the uh, three-dimensional space. And I would say, I would hazard to say that uh, Emmy's practice is moving from sculpture toward installation. Emmy, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here, Victor. Um, Thanks for joining us, Emmy. That's, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for uh, putting this on. This is just uh, terrific for us to be able to um, talk to people and, um, and thank God for Zoom that we can continue to do that even in lockdown. So, yeah. Yeah, well, th yes, thank you, Emmy. And um, of course, yes, we're, <laughs> we're having our little bumps, but... Um, but we, uh, we're, we're learning from this as we go. So thanks for joining us. I wanted to start, um, I guess, talking a little bit about your previous practice leading into this. You, um, from your own uh, uh, background, I know that uh, Rodin was a, a big influence on your sculptural practice. Um, and um, the, certainly the human figure if, uh, is, is very strong in your work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how 
what this exhibition represents in terms of a perhaps a um, an intersection in or a or a fork in in your uh, in your practice. Sure. Um, I guess when you say yeah, when I say that I, I'm influenced by Rodin, I um, often you know people may think that perhaps it's mainly because of the, the figurative sculpture, which it, which it is as well. That classical figure, which I've sort of um, explored for a while in, um, in through a traditional um, uh, you know education way back when. But um, my interest in Rodin, in fact, is more his drawings. And I uh, particularly love the quick sketches that he used to do and would wonder why, why does someone who, can, who sculpts a figure in such a classical way, what is it that 100 or so years ago was interested in that quick gestural mark? What was he looking at? What was he trying to capture? And so on. And I often wondered why he didn't sculpt like he drew. And that's where my interest comes into it. And so uh, through my, in my practice, what I've done is um, I've, I've been concerned with gestural marks as a bodily record of time. And, uh, and for me, I guess drawing, it comes first. And as in terms of my practice, um, I trained in painting. Um, and but and now I sculpt more than anything else. But between all of those things, drawing is there, is present in everything. So um, yeah, I kind of um, so what I've done is actually tried to to push my drawing into that three dimensional realm and try and work out where that intersection lies. Um, been looking at. Um, sort of the correlation between artists, the material and sight and time and um, have been uh, playing with the idea of action drawings with, with wax, for example, and sort of responding to something um, to the body and, and the body's influence on the material as well um, and where that takes me. So, um, so it, it, that's the core of my 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 practice and what I kind of try and investigate. Um, I'm also interested in sort of that sort of um, what else happens when we respond. What is that? You know, is it? It's another form of communication. It's sort of what what's a gesture? You know, how what does a gesture say? And how and how can it be read? So so not only is it about sort of, well, it's about the duality of um, the conceptual and process-based art and sort of understanding and, and having that comparative reading and sort of looking at it um, from both perspectives. So responding and yet, you know, um, in, a, in a particular site, it becomes, the reading becomes something else, especially when it's you know the viewer uh, the viewer is involved or it's that encounter that 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 the artist has with the material as i did with uh, the beautiful lump of charcoal <laughs> i was going to come to that emmy yes <laughs> i think for me that that work is sums up a lot what you're talking about in terms of process uh, and gesture yeah. and um i would hazard to say it's the largest charcoal drawing or certainly the last largest piece of charcoal I have ever seen used to draw yeah. um, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness um, you know the, the that work uh, is is a drawing it is a sculpture it is an installation and it, it's conceptual and it was um, for a certain moment to uh, an act uh, you know an, an, an act of uh, a, a performative piece, if you like. Yeah. yeah. Which um, you guys uh, sort of filmed while I was doing it. Um, I'll just let everyone know that the, the actual work was made made on site at Cunahan Gallery, and we were, were literally sort of unravelled this giant roll of pristine paper and pushed the act of pushing this whole thing across the floor and, and creating it. There I might get um, Claire to see if she can just get the image <laughs> up on screen for us while you're talking about it. Yeah. Um, the image of the charcoal uh, 
uh, the, the long cascading paper with the charcoal drawing. Sorry to interrupt you there, Emmy. Please go on. No, no. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so I guess it is all those things. So it's sort of um, an ex. You know, I think we as artists we carry sort of our our voice and what we we're, we're on about with us wherever we are and whatever we do and. And with this, it is, it's also about an embodied subjectivity. It's an embodied knowledge, uh, you know, um, and experience. Um, and it's my, it's an empathy to the material and it's, it's, it's responding to, to um, you know, confluence and, uh, and the other, what the exhibition is about. Um, it's all of those things. Um, very deliberately thinking also about that crossover between two-dimensional work and three-dimensional work and that liminal space of how they intersect and where, where, where is that point where, where, where a 2D work becomes a 3D work. And I guess, you know, in this, you know, contemporary sort of art world, you know, things are never quite what they seem. A painting's never a painting or a drawing's never a drawing or, or whatever. It can be both. But but for me it was a it was a deliberate um, concern. And and by by having the paper on the sort of sweeping off the floor uh, off the wall onto the floor, it sort of was able to achieve that. But the big charcoal drawing on on this thing just, um, yeah, sort of, it, it was exciting. And I knew as soon as I saw this charcoal, <laughs> um, which was um, on my property, there was a controlled burn off and um, uh, these trees that had been felled, they were pine trees, which were, we were reducing our fire um, risk hazard on the property and some old pine trees, which we never really liked anyway because of the fact that they, they uh, weren't um, in, uh, indigenous trees and they were, pine trees sort of don't allow anything else to grow underneath them and all this other stuff anyway. So the farmer, you know, in the 50s had planted them and we, we always wanted to sort of try and, and sort of bring back the bush. Um, and so by having to reduce our fire risk danger, we sort of, uh, we did. We burnt them off. So, the, so, the, so still, there's that connection with them, and there's a story behind this tree, um, which, which we, yeah. When, when I, when I saw it though, after the burn off died down, it, it was quite bizarre because it just glistened in the sun, and it sort of, it's like one of those oh, moments where it just spoke to me and said. You know, you, I, I need to draw with this thing because it was just a charcoal to me. It was just a, a mm. giant charcoal. I was going to ask, so yeah, the moment of discovery and what what it meant to to what to fall in love with with this with, with yeah, the stuff. I did fall in love with it, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what I mean by that is that that it was that sort of rawness and sort of that authenticity of this this material, which sort of echoed. Um, the history of drawing and charcoal and the fact that it's such a time-honoured medium. But the tree, sort of, even though it was scorched and primal, it's still a cherished resource and, um, and which we make drawings from and scratchings and, and pushing and pulling and all that sort of stuff. It's, so, it, it's interesting to think about, you know, it does make it does make me think about charcoal in a completely different way that there's yeah. in a way that you know there's this act of sacrifice in a way yeah. um that the that these trees are making for 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 this and but but in your work i see it in a way as um and this is probably uh, you know anthropocentric projection but um but seeing it as the tree, uh, an, a way, another way that the tree can express itself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's mm. sort of, it goes back to, to even, you know, Paleolithic drawings on cave walls, you know, the first charcoal sort of drawings that were done there. And, and, and that sort of rawness was what, what really spoke to me. Um, 
you know, I still sort of, again, pulled with me all the things that I'm interested in and the, the gesture. So for me, it was this action of, of pushing and the presence of the body. And as you said, it's, it's sort of present within the whole exhibition that the body is there without being there and mm. all the marks that are made. Um, yeah, they, they, they speak to, to the viewer about the body. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think also for me, and I'm, I'm thinking also about your previous practice too, um, that even though in terms of your media, this it's certainly there seems to be an, evol an evolution or a, maybe, I don't know, maybe a, a simplification in a way, but um, mm -hmm. what I wanted to say was that there, there seems to be an element in your practice about impermanence. So mm -hmm. whether it's... Um, whether or it's the, the, the body as a gestural notion rather than something solid, but it's mm. something that's always changing, or mm. whether it's um, whether it's this particular kind of work here where it's the uh, it's it's the object as a gesture um, and a performance mm. uh, that that can only happen kind of once briefly and fleetingly. Mm. Yeah, so I guess it's situational as well as temporal and um, and, and as well as embodied, um, you know, uh, emotion and and it's it's all of those things together. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and so for you, Emmy, my, my final question to you will just be, you know, do, do you do you see where this is going to take you next? Um, uh, look, I guess with all artists' work, it's sort of one thing always leads to another and there's this sort of element of discovery. Um, and, um, and even though, like, the work, there's a simplification to the work now, it's still about the same things. It's still about gestural marks, uh, you know, as a bodily record of time. It's still... It's still um, you know, about trying to capture that essence, you know, that, 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 that fleeting moment um, of energy that, that happens. Um, it, I'll probably just continue on my merry way <laughs> and just keep pushing it. I love the fact that, that you know, in, in it, to be able to connect with artists like Jeremy and Claire, we're able to take all our works and sort of... Um, you know, have a message that, that sort of speaks um, in terms of it politically and our current situation about COVID, about all of those things. And I, I think um, it's important that artists keep um, trying to push through this strange time. And even by having this um, platform where we can still continue to talk, um, even by the, the um, you know, the, going the virtual tours of the the um the exhibition it's not great but it's it's something and so mm -hmm. important that we we keep pushing through and and keep trying to sort of uh, you know examine why we're here and sort of what what where, the direction that we the planet's going that that we are taking it in and and um, yeah, and sort of, and hopefully people can start reflecting on the fact that maybe, maybe it is time that we changed how we do things. Well, I think you've done that superbly, Emmy, and uh, and the other exhibitors too. And you know, uh, art as social conscience, I think, is is one of the strengths of this um, of this exhibition that shows that you know this is what artists what artists do. So I'd like to thank you. Thank um, you and for joining us and but we want to keep you around too because we, we will come back to the three artists but I thank you Emmy and I'd like to now introduce our special guest uh, Deborah Hart who um, I'm, uh, who has kindly joined us today and is um, going to respond to the artists and to the exhibition uh, uh, Deborah Hart is an arts focused activist and a writer from Melbourne and she has after 16 years working in uh, development roles with leading Australian arts and culture organisations 
Um, she left her profession in order to devote more time to climate activism. Uh, Deborah founded LIVE, which is Locals into Victorian Environment in 2006, and later co-founded Climate 2010, which you would, many of you would know, uh, the body that um, coordinates the Art Plus Climate uh, Equals Change Festival every two years, and of which uh, our own Coonahan Gallery has been um, affiliated with on a number of occasions. Welcome to you, Deborah. Thank you, Victor. And yeah, it's it's such a privilege on behalf of Climate to be part of this discussion. It's a gorgeous show. And even via Zoom and, and just looking at it through images, I feel like we can smell it, almost kind of taste it. It's textural and it's, it's um, yeah, it, it is, I think, reasonable for us all to feel some grief that um, we can't actually walk around and be part of it and all be together. But it, it certainly, it, it's, yeah, a beautiful show. And, and it's been really fantastic to hear all of the artists actually talk about what's inspired them. And this is, this is exactly what Climate originally established to advance exactly these sorts of questions. What does it mean to, to be alive? What, what, what should we, take from this time we've we've had science that goes back to the 60s demonstrating exactly what problems we were facing you know Rachel Carson's silent spring we've had warnings from the health experts um, planetary health experts the the interdependence between human health and planetary health um, the idea that we can have any systems that um, operate in a, a mechanical mind fashion, which seeks to silo and compartmentalize everything. And, and it feels like we're all part of um, a kind of spotlight of all of that now. It feels like um, a confluence of sort of everything we've been warned about for a very long time, just all in our face. Um, and this is a, the health crisis we're in, which is, is entirely uh, connected to the planetary crisis that we've created. These are all problems of our making. And we also have all of the solutions. So um, I guess I, I could go in many different directions. <laughs> But to bring the confluence of ideas really back together and why I think a show like this is so incredibly valuable is it does really enable us to reflect and to imagine what's most important. And this time, as, as mm. the artists were, were saying themselves, that we've all had an opportunity to stop and start to listen more, observe that peppercorn tree, observe those lorikeets who just have the best time. I don't know if you've ever observed some of our, we've seen black cockatoos flying around. Sadly, that's also possibly largely because so much of their own habitat has been destroyed during the fires. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's a brilliant theme. I think the artists have, you know, I just think it's gorgeous work. The essays in the catalogue are, are beautiful it's just you know beautifully written and um yeah i really think this is exactly what how we best should be reflecting as humans right now well deborah thank you for that um i i for those um who are perhaps um unaware the exhibition confluence um uh was really being held in abeyance for a long period of time with the first lockdown that we experienced. And we really didn't know whether we would be able to show the exhibition at all. And of course, it, the, 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 the sands were shifting weekly, daily, um, and the artists were also incredibly patient um, and, 
and understanding, and I mentioned this in the introduction to the to the catalog. Um, uh, we finally got to the point where we could install the show, which was later than anticipated. It, it was going to be a shorter show regardless. And um, we had been open for just one week when we did have to close. So there was a very brief window there where we did have, for those who were lucky enough um, to, to come along uh, and see the show to experience it firsthand, you know, um, it was a wonderful thing. And, uh, and then that was sadly, you know, um, cut short very quickly. And so I, I'm, I, I'm going to sort of um, bring this in, sort of into a circle here, uh, Deborah, with what you were saying about um, what's important. And I think it does crystallise um, what is important and um, that we can, we can be distracted by little things that really are not so important or are not that, um, do not really have that much of an impact. But we can, we can uh, listen, as you say, and we have, we have the uh, experience, we have the knowledge, we have the experts. Um, it, it requires us just to, to start listening and to start acting upon that, that uh, expert advice. And can I, can I, sorry, can I, it sounds like I'm echoing. Um, you may all recall, we actually had for a very brief period of time um, when the Gillard government um, was formed, it, you know, was basically a multi-party kind of formation in many ways. The multi-party climate change committee that was established went through a rigorous, highly democratic process, which was, you know, very interesting listening to all of the experts in fields of economics, in, in health, in, you know, science, and right across the spectrum. And they drafted a um, brilliant legislation, the Clean Energy Future, which was a whole range of packages that operated for two years. We had emissions coming down radically very quickly and it was very threatening to some vested interests. So this idea that we don't have the solutions and that we can't actually address it very quickly is just rubbish. Yeah. And the fact that it was so quickly killed and with such force and with so much kind of propaganda behind that, really that we've entered such a reactionary space does suggest to us all that we should be really hopeful because for a very short period of time, but a very important period of time, Australia actually led with arguably the best suite of climate and environment protection laws in the world. So we really, you know, this, this time and all of this public money that now needs to go into rebuilding our economy, all of the solutions are there. And um, Claire, thank you for that. I wanted to, before um, I throw open um, questions to all of our panellists, I did want to just um, see if I could get from you a sense of what might be in store for next year and the festival. Is there anything you can tell us? Hello, Claire. Oh, sorry, sorry, Deborah. I oh, sorry, I meant Deborah. That's that's why that's why there was that strange strange silence there. I I, I used okay. the wrong name. I think it'd be great to hear Claire's views on this too. <laughs> um, well, actually, Climart has been going through a bit of an evolutionary period now too because. Well, you know, 10 years ago when we founded, we knew very well that artists were very concerned about these issues and that artists are the best communicators we have. And that's not to say, you know, artists are ex extroverted, you know, out there kind of talkers. They're deep thinkers and they're extremely good at bringing together complex ideas and, and then putting them in, in ways that are not so confronting to people who are confused by, you know, a lot of propaganda, which a lot of, as we know, our mainstream media has um, fallen into for, you know, not by accident. 
Um, so it's been a really, really interesting period for us to actually pull together after having three, you know, really successful festivals. And we really feel that, um, yeah, we've, 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 we've succeeded in bringing, I think, together a really wonderful, brilliant community of artists who are speaking very clearly and, and, and articulately in this, this realm. And there's so much more that we can do now. So we're in an excited space. And I guess that's where I have to lead to one of the things that kept going through my mind, reading the cat catalog, was of currency and currency and flow currency of financially you know the the flow of of money is something that has has really um you know all of these kind of fissures and fracturing of our economy because it's obviously flowed in a, an obscenely kind of inequitable way so the community art that we have now the galleries like the Cunahan gallery actually supporting these activities and this questioning and these opportunities to come together and to reflect are really more critically important than ever. So it's, it's been, um, yeah, a very interesting time and artists have been among the hardest hit and yet they are an essential service. The culture that we have, have, I guess, again, found to be one of the most life-sustaining forces, how we remain connected, how we keep asking the fundamental and existential questions of what it is like to be a human and a human now, and a human sharing this incredibly abundant and gorgeous planet with, you know, all of our other carbon-based stardust combined species, because ultimately that's, you know, what we all are, just different forms of it. You know, it's, yeah, it's been a really, yeah, a really interesting time, I think, to reflect on the arts, the role of the arts in our communities, the role of galleries like yours in supporting artists and the communities that are so inspired by them. So. Thank you, Deborah. Look, and look, we do hope that we can support the, the festival again. Um, of course, everything is, um, a, a, again, sort of a, a daily, weekly, monthly proposition at the moment. But we do hope to support you again in the future. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you. We so appreciate it. I mean, the festival is because of galleries like yours and the artists like, yeah, like Claire and Emmy and Jeremy, who just, who create the work that is the festival. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And look, stay with us while we um, I, we go to our Q and A. So, for our audience at home, if you have any questions, please send them through in the chat. Um, I've got a few questions I'm going to ask uh, just to warm warm up uh, the, the the three exhibitors. Um, and if you have, yeah, as I say, if you have any questions, pop them through in the chat, and we'll see if we can get to those. So. Um, to all of uh, to all of the artists, um, I wanted to ask just about the history of your connection as a group, and um, whether the exhibition confluence was a confluence in itself. You know, how did it come into being? I might uh, start with that one. I'm sure the others will have something to add as well. Um, we all are fortunate to study together at the moment. So we're currently doing a Master of Contemporary Art at BCA and currently online. Um, but for last year, we were fortunate to actually be able to spend time with each other and to go to each other's studios and hang out and chat and look at what each other's doing. Um, Emmy and I have known each other for some years and, and we've been fortunate to exhibit together in the past in uh, an all women show, which was wonderful. And we found um, as your application came up, I was really thinking about, you know, some of the things that uh, we have in common in our work, some of the common threads. And I really, really love the work of both Emmy and Jeremy. And was so excited when they said, yes, let, let's put something together to, um, to do this show. And our initial 
thinking, which Jeremy suggested, was around water. So it began with a wateriness, which is present in across our work. And we, um, through many discussions and back and forth, we, we came to this word confluence, which kind of yeah, brought an uh, umbrella idea to all the ways that we practice. Amy and Jeremy, do you have any uh, um, uh, anything you'd like to, to add to that? <laughs> Come on, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> um, about, about how we came together? Yeah. Or, well, I guess it's, yeah, it's just the, the shared themes that, that all of our works as like underlying the different forms um, speaks to the importance of the preservation of the natural environment and then and sort of and how perhaps through art that you can become more attuned to to these other worlds and and in the sense of sort of connection um yeah i guess in, in one way it's it's it's, it's, it's good mad trying to counteract the bad magic um of the media markets industry uh, yeah could, could go on but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a nice way of uh of um uh of verbalizing that uh jeremy and emmy did did you want to to I add wanted, something there i love these two people <laughs> <laughs> and they are, um, they're inspiring. It's, it's just inspiring to be around them and to listen to what they, um, how they approach things and what they do. And I guess we all bounce off each other. And um, as Claire said, we're all studying together as well. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a really, really good time um, in that regard. And, um, and, yeah, it's sort of allowed us to... Um, to working together on this show to really sort of, um, uh, I, I think what was exciting is the way that, the, that all three of our works just sort of spoke to each other and that the whole, the whole show just seemed to have this fantastic sort of flow and energy to it that, that happened and, um, yeah, so I guess it's interesting when you're in a show, you sort of go in it with intentions of how things will go and what have you, but then there's always there's an element of, of a surprise. And mm. in this particular case where we knew that the works would sit well together, but I think I was particularly um, just amazed and excited at how, how in tune all three of the, the artists we all seem to be. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to come back to that as well. But before I do that, I would like to um, ask, uh, ask you all, um, within the catalogue, um, in addition to Ashley Crawford's wonderful essay, um, there are many literary references um, to writers such as uh, David Campbell, Cormac McCarthy, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Ben Okri, Rebecca Solnit, who we mentioned before, and Rabindranath Tagore. Um, I just wanted to know to what degree the exhibition was uh, prompted or informed by literature, and um, if you could comment, any of you, would like to comment on the relationship between text and image. Interesting. Um, I, I do love to read and a lot of those texts are, are ones that I've, I guess I look for, you know, the ideas are present first for me in, in, case, in the case with this work, but because of the kinds of reading that I do and the things that I'm interested in, you know, from poetry to literature to um, philosophy or, or art theory, it can't help but feed into the way that I think and then that can feed into how I make all the decisions I make um, as I make. So some of those texts, you know, like um, Tagore, for example, um, really spoke to, you know, the region through Bengal and, and Assam with that river that he talks about is the main life source river and it, and it brings so much fertility and abundance to that region. 
So to have a text like that, which talks about some of the nature of what we're doing, but also what it is like to live with nature and to appreciate it, um, that, that's part of what it was for me. I, I know the others also have interest in text as well, so I might hand over to them. Um, I think perhaps for me, uh, some of the, the main um, texts I've been reading, um, be um, David Abram, sort of, he's got a wonderful book called Becoming Animal, which is sort of tuning into sort of animal senses and then opening the conversation and, and listening with others, being, being trees, birds or, or rivers. Um, I've been reading, and also Michael Tausig, who sort of is an anthropologist, an amazing author. So he, so really when I started the process sort of mimesis with, with the tree, it was, that was perhaps prompted through, through reading his work on, and also on shamans. Um, also I'm a huge fan of Ursula Le Guin as well. I guess, yeah, just, just magic and, and then the fact that, that the world is alive and sort of brimming and it's not just, just, we're not just the center and the only things with, with sentience and agency. And how about you, Amy? Do, do you have literary uh, influences? Of course. Um, I'm like Claire was saying that you can't help but but sort of have um, anything you read sort of come come and enhance what it is you're doing, whether it's deliberate or not sometimes. Um, I think uh, we actually were reading Amelia Jones's um, Encountering, which was um, on the conceptual body of the when, where and how art is uh, experienced uh, was something we read recently in, at uni. <laughs> but actually it, it really sort of resonated with me and, and that whole idea of, of that we're not just on our own. It's that, that, that what we do is, is, is connected to the world around us in so many ways. Um, and, and, you know, how the viewer experiences or whatever. And I think, yeah, it's that sort of stuff that I think, yeah, really, really excites me, so. There's a question we've got from our uh, participants here, our audience, that's actually for Jeremy about um, fatherhood and how that is for you in terms of your art practice and has it changed anything for you? Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, it must, it must be having an effect, perhaps, I'm not sure, but I mean, we've got a seven-month-old daughter called River, so, I mean, River's been helping me every morning, so, until she starts grizzling, which, which means you, you keep in motion when visiting the peppercorn tree at times, um, but I think... Yeah, I, I couldn't put a concrete example on how she's influenced me, but I, I only hope for for the better, and I guess to think more about the future and fragility, and and perhaps in our actions, and 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 what I can teach her in terms of knowledge, which like this visiting the tree has sort of has been amazing for that, and hopefully that that sort of those sort of exercises in perception, if I continue those, can sort of pass on that to her. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, an, another question, um, which regards to, uh, again, back to Ashley Crawford's essay and his, his recognition in all of your work about the, the, the mythic and the, the mysterious thread that connects your connects your work and and I also think there's a great sense in a lot of those those writers um, that I previously mentioned that uh, it resonates with um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Ashley Crawford also mentions too I think he kind of recognizes that when you're dealing with myth that it it can there can be um, a danger of slipping into cliche but your work has successful, successfully navigated 
that um, particular pitfall. And I wanted to ask you um, about um, how conscious you are of that sort of tension between uh, uh, something uh, between story or narrative, but avoiding being too either preachy or didactic, if that makes sense. I think this is a real tightrope. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's real. It's a real challenge to find a way to um, you know express um, the intention of a work in a way that uh, is evocative and inviting um, and has some clarity. So I think that that is always kind of a bit like a tightrope walk. And there are times when, you know, perhaps more clear narrative is, is really suitable and other times when, um, when it's the mystery of the work might be more dominant. And I feel, you know, for, for myself in these works, I, maybe I was looking for something a bit more lyrical um, even though the landscape is kind of evident, um, I think it still has a, a meditative aspect. So maybe it leaves room for people to bring themselves into it. Uh, Jeremy or Emmy, would you like to comment on that? I think yeah. definitely the, um, oh. the the fact that I mean, we met, someone mentioned earlier that that the work's not it, there's obvious themes present but not necessarily present like the body or whatever um, I think it's always wonderful to discover things as a viewer as well and and I think with all of our works there's there even though the intention is quite clear in our heads <laughs> that perhaps it does allow that space for the viewer to to encounter and to discover elements of a work and to bring into it sort of a connection and their own reading emotional reading of the work and I guess if we can achieve that somehow um, it's a good thing so yes <laughs> I, yeah I agree I think the work is the important thing is the experience yep. um, yeah I think and that it, it's it's lasting the effect is is more lasting than uh, if, if the if the uh, if it is if it's too, too didactic and the work has already all of the work has been done for the audience then um it's boring <laughs> <laughs> well it is if you've you're yes. sitting in front yes. of an artwork and it's all done it's like okay yeah sure yeah but it's like you know like my i don't like being told what to do <laughs> so like don't like being told what to think either so so that's the beauty of art is that you when you you it, it's about allowing that space for, for for others to to take from it as well and uh jeremy did you want to add anything uh before i i have one more question um yeah i mean i, I would agree i think there i mean there's even been times there's been times when i've visited the tree and with a perhaps something pre-planned in mind so it's almost like the, my ration, the rational brain takes over and there's never turns out well and because i'm never i'm not fully immersed in the experience and it's it, it gets in the way same as it's sort of i guess this idea of that we can do so much without consciousness if we just allowed the sort of intuition and sort of bodily, bodily um, knowledge to sort of take over. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, that even in the making as well, we sort of need to be open to things as well. It's, not, it's never quite as black and white as I'm going to make this and this is how I'm going to make it. Um, it's, it. It is about allowing yourself that, that openness and sort of um, just the and the, the process of awareness of what's going on around you and responding, responding to what's happening. So, so um, my final question, Emmy, uh, it was something that uh, came through our pre, uh, our um, when I was talking to you previously. Um, uh, so I wanted to know what the exhibition uh, has prompted for you in term in terms of term of its. I guess it's culmination as a presentation. What what do you each think is next for you individually or as a collective? 
or are you still thinking about it? I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> no, I, I think, I mean, I, I was saying before that one thing always leads to another and, and, and again, it's about that being open to allowing thing, that growth to happen. And I think this experience has, has for me, just been such an amazing um, experience in, in terms of discovering what can be achieved with three artists and, you know, uh, getting together and sort of, um, you know, making a statement about, about the world. Um, but individually um, as well, I guess even that sort of, sort of flows on into that. And, uh, you know, I still, still grapple with the things that I grapple with, you know, what I said earlier, that bodily, that gestural marks and um, as a bodily record of time is something that I've grappled with my whole life, even when I was young. And it actually, um, it, it's uh, interesting now, I'm not that old, but, but now that I'm older, but <laughs> that you still pull these, these things still come with you. And um, whether, what changes is the form that it takes perhaps, and, and what may change is your materials or the site or, or, or the environment around you. But, but for me, even discussing like confluence and, and you know, uh, what's happening in the world at the moment, it's still my way of expressing it is still my way of doing it. And that's through, through that quick response, that sort of, um, you know, finding, it, finding um, a voice in the, in, in the, in the ephemeral almost, you know, making it sort of solid with of, of something that's fleeting, no matter what I say, you know, no matter what, what the, what I'm trying to do, that's probably how I approach, my approach would be. And what, what I learn as I go on is, is that that voice is just, that thing has become stronger and it becomes, yeah, I kind of know that now, but, you know, I sort of, I know that that's, that's, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's just part of, part of my way of approaching it. And over to someone else now. <laughs> Jeremy. Thank you, Amy. Jer Jeremy, we might go to you next and finish with Claire. Um, I don't, yeah, I'm not too sure what's, I mean, I guess I do have some, some works that I sort of, I'd like to keep moving and, and keep making and, and be open to, to new directions um yeah but it's i've been mean, i'm just so thrilled that we did this show because there's there was so much up in the air and whether mm. there would anyone could actually walk into the gallery was going to be sort of unknown but really, really happy that claire and emmy pushed pushed me <laughs> and we did it so yeah it's been wonderful and claire Oh, sorry. I was just going to add that yes, the COVID aspect of it has—we've learned a lot from that. That that um, that that as artists, we 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 have to keep pushing through. This is this is um, regardless of how the goalposts change, we still have to keep working. And so that's what I've learned with that. Sorry, Claire. Go on. Oh, great point, Emmy. Yeah, um, I think. One of the things I've really loved about this is how I work has come together, like Emmy said, and that's been really exciting. Um, you know, some of the feedback has been, oh, you know, it could possibly have been one artist, like it all fits together so beautifully, or, you know, it looks like you've worked together for so long to bring it together. Um, so it was a really beautiful thing that there's this affinity between us that our work can complement each other and maybe add other things that, perhaps on its own would say a different story. So it's really lovely to be able to weave our different ways of working together. And um, collaboration is something that I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in kind of shifting from like a, a single person voice to a co-authoring kind of way of doing things. And yes, I, I love my own practice and, you know, I'm so motivated to do that, but I also really, really love working with others. So one of the things that I'm, uh, now working on is with another artist, deaf artist, Shell De Stefano, And so we've launched a project which is about uh, bringing together the stories from the deaf community called What I Wish I'd Told You. 
So um, we're really sort of looking forward to seeing that and really highlighting deaf culture and deaf voices. Whereas I'm you know, more of a, just a kind of a developer behind the project, um, Shell and the deaf community will really be co-authoring that project. And, and that is also, again, about this ancestral transmission. You know, my mother's first language is Osla and my, grand, my grandparents are both profoundly deaf. And I'm named after my deaf grandmother. So um, there's this, her name is Olive. So my second name is Olivia, just in case people are wondering who's that person. Um, yeah, so um, it's part of bringing through and treasuring ancestry, treasuring culture, but also um, reviving it, um, making sure it lives on. And yeah, those sorts of things, I guess, are part of what's come out of this that I can carry forward in other ways. Well, thank you, Claire, and uh, congratulations again to all of you on a beautiful show. Um, I hope you do work together again uh, because it is such a successful show and uh, um, I'm glad that we were able to share it in some uh, small way for those who weren't lucky enough to see it. I'd like to, I'd also like to thank the three of you just for being so wonderful to work with through the process in what was a very challenging and then um, uh, of course, uh, having suffering that setback and uh, all handling it with such great grace and uh, understanding and empathy. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just been a superb experience and um, one that I will treasure for many years to come. Um, I'd like to also thank our very special guest speaker, Deborah Hart, for joining us today from Climart. Um, it's just wonderful to have you here and we hope that we'll be uh, working with you again uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you to uh, our Auslan interpreters today, to, uh, to Kiki and to Sarah and our captioner Jason. Uh, thank you to my Coonahan colleagues, Nikki, Leon and also Eamon who helped with the presentation of this show. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Joseph Goding from Goding Projects who managed to get this uh, virtual exhibition up in less than a week um, so that we could have it available for us today for the floor talk. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, sorry if we have not got to your question, we are over time. Um, but if you do have any questions, I am sure that you can shoot them to the gallery. We're very happy to pass them on to the artists. The artists catalog, which is available through the links that we've provided also have email, direct email addresses to the artists and websites. So you can certainly contact um, the artists uh, directly if you would like to. I'm sure, that, I'm sure they won't mind some, uh, some fan, fan mail. Um, and uh, last of all, I would just like to remind everyone to keep following us. Uh, we are still working here behind the scenes, so you can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. We do send regular updates. Uh, you can also join our mailing list as well. So uh, thank you, everyone. And before we go, I want to thank Victor to you and the um, gallery who have been absolutely superb. Um, and very professional and, um, and uh, yeah, we, with this whole thing, you've all handled it beautifully. Your staff are amazing. You're amazing. Um, and so, and yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.